Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Bell, the Director of Collections at the Royal Armouries. I hope you had an enjoyable Christmas break. And um, despite the third lockdown we have faced in the UK and numerous challenges around the world, uh, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all back and to the seventh talk in our winter lecture series. The Royal Armouries, for those of you who aren't familiar with us already, is the UK's national collection of arms and armour, with a history dating back to the Middle Ages. We operate across a number of platforms, including our main museum in Leeds, our historic base at the Tower of London, Fort Nelson, which is our uh, Victorian fortification outside Portsmouth, where we keep the bulk of our artillery collection, and of course, our digital platforms, which you will all have become much more familiar with over the last year. As you most likely know, all of our physical sites are unfortunately currently closed, but the objects that we have on display are really only the tip of the iceberg. And we have a number of objects in our study collection. In particular, um, and, and to do with today's talk, the former pattern room collection gifted to us by the Ministry of Defence is an unparalleled group of objects, and many of which are actually modern firearms. Though the core of the pattern room collection consists of British service weapons, it includes many objects acquired from other countries for comparative purposes, as well as a range of unsuccessful or un unadopted prototypes. Its scope and depth are critical for the kind of detailed study we'll hear Jonathan describe today. Given that our museums are closed, if you would like to get closer to the collection, please do go to our website, which is royalarmories.org or send an email via our inquiries, which is inquiries at armories.org.uk. As always, there will be a question and answer session after the talk. And if you're watching on YouTube, please type your question in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. And if you're watching via Zoom, you'll find a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen where you can type questions and we'll be keeping an eye on those for you. To those who participated in the talk last time on electoral violence before Christmas, the researchers have asked me to reiterate the thanks to all those who completed the survey. And also congratulations to the winner. We really hope that you enjoy the books on the Home Guard. With the necessary preparation out of the way, I really am truly delighted to introduce our speaker today, Jonathan Ferguson. Jonathan Ferguson is our keeper of firearms and artillery. His research interests include the use and effect of firearms and their depiction in popular culture. His publications include the book, Mauser Broom Handle Pistol, and a contribution to the right to bear arms, historical perspectives and the debate on the second amendment. Jonathan has curated or co-curated a number of displays or exhibitions, and of course, the most recent display in Leeds, which is Firefight, Second World War. Jonathan has also made several media appearances, including the History Channel's Sean Bean on Waterloo and Channel 5's Inside the Tower of London. Today's talk covers the British military, military's interest in the bullpup rifle, the innovative but complicated shortened rifles which form the subject of Jonathan's upcoming book, Thornycroft to SA-80, British Bullpup Firearms 1901 to 2020, with Headstamp Publishing, which you will have seen on the opening slides. Anyway, um, really, without any further ado, it, it's over to Jonathan, um, and thank you very much, and I'll speak to you after. Thanks very much, Laura. I appreciate the introduction there. Um, I'm terrible for um, setting myself up for a huge swathe of history and sort of having a canter through that rather than focusing in on um, nice manageable subjects. I thought I had done that by selecting bullpups, but it, as it turned out, these things have been around for quite some time, hence the title of the book. Um, hopefully you can see the first of my slides. I promise, I, I, well, I can't promise. I uh, hope this won't be death by, by PowerPoint for you. Um, so what, what, what on earth is a bullpup? Um, we bandy this word around a fair bit in the firearms world. It's actually more intuitive than many of us thought, actually. One, one of the things I did for, for this exercise was to delve into the etymology of the, of the word, which we'll come to in a moment. But just so that we're on the same page, this is a diagram from a 19, early 1970s Royal Small Arms Factory Enfield uh, study on what the new rifle would be. So we're jumping ahead here to the late 20th century. 
Um, we're going to jump back in time in a minute. Don't worry. And you can see from this, don't worry about the labeled, the letters. Um, they, they describe different sort of proportions and things. Oh, bear with me. Sorry. I have made the classic Zoom error. There we are. Got it now. Right. So you should have it now. And so this diagram shows you two sort of notional designs for a rifle at this at this point of development nothing was was super firm and they were trying to present the relative merits of what a bullpup uh, could provide for the british army for other forces that, that would adopt whatever the british ended up developing in the 1970s and you can see i think from this quite quite easily firstly the magazine that feeds the rounds into the weapon in the unorthodox configuration is behind the trigger and behind the, the grip, the pistol grip by this time of firearms development, gives you more control over the weapon. Uh, so that's often said to be um, a feature of a bullpup, but there are bullpups that don't have conventional magazines, don't have, you know, it's not always a feature. The key thing to look at here is the barrel, the representation of the barrel, which is the same in both diagrams, has different furniture around it, as, as, we, as we call it. On the unorthodox on or bullpup rifle, the pistol grip, the trigger mechanism, all of that, it, you can see that it's below the barrel it's, and it's well forward. That's the key thing. The, the breech, the sort of swollen bit at the back of the barrel where the cartridge is, is fed in, where the chamber is, that's behind the trigger and it's behind the grip. And one of the things uh, we had to do for the book was have a working definition of what a bullpup is. And for me, there are a couple of things in the book that are extremely marginal, but it's a firearm where the breech, the back of the barrel, so we can see there's a line there marked B, the leftmost of those, that's where the, the breech is. That must be behind the some or all of the grip. The definitions are an absolute nightmare. If you've ever tried to technically define something to rule out everything you that people don't think of something and rule in everything that people do think of as something, it's extremely taxing, but um, that's what we came up with, myself and my editor. And I think this is the one of the best diagrams I've seen. So we put that in there. Uh, bear with me. So I mentioned etymology, which is... Um, I'm sure you're aware, but the, the study of, of where words come from, what they mean. And <laughs> this isn't just a gratuitous, cute dog picture, although it's that as well. Long story short, a bullpup means, means what it sounds like. Um, the form of word, bullpup, as one word, is not particularly common in speech or, or, or in writing today, which I think is why people have sort of forgotten what bullpup means. Um, or at least are uncertain about it. But in the 19th century, probably before, and the early 20th century, when the bullpup really becomes a thing, this was a commonly used word, um, short for bulldog puppy, usually two separate words, bull pup, hence I've, I've separated them out there. And it's, it, it fits. It's a, it's a weapon, not a dog, that is um, short, squat, still fierce, still dangerous. That's that's the pretty clear meaning um, of the word. Uh, in fact, I've got a reference here, just digging out for you. So in, in this, this term is in use for these rifles of that configuration that I've just explained, probably from the 1930s. Um, first reference is 1940. And the first firm confirmation of what I'm saying about where it comes from is a 1944 American Rifleman article, um, which was subtitled, Your Pup May Bite You. And um, there's also, a, which, which incidentally refers to one of the perceived flaws of the bullpup, which is that you might get hot high pressure gas jetting out of the gun into your face because putting the breech behind the grip means that the action is next to your face, which is a concern we see crop up time and time again. Um, still, still cited today, the, the gun might even blow up 
and, and kill you or something, which isn't really a thing apart from one incident that I might mention later. Um, and there's a 1950 article titled Care and Feeding of Bull Pups. And it, it just to confirm, that is from a firearms magazine, not from a uh, pet care one. So that's, that's where that comes from. Um, I mentioned one British term for these things, unorthodox. Um, we pretty steadfastly in Britain refuse to call them bull pups. Uh, we use initially, well, initially there isn't really a, a set term for it in, in the, the weapons that I'll introduce in a moment. By the 1940s, we're using the term stockless because for the Brits, that's the key thing, removing the butt. Um, it, it, the, the, we, we think of, incidentally, I haven't mentioned why you would want to recess the barrel into the gun, which is effectively what you're doing here. As you've probably guessed, for those of you who don't know, you get the same length of barrel in a much shorter overall package. So let's say your, your, the cartridge that you've chosen is ballistically optimum at a 20 inch barrel, which is um, uh, what's in the M16, the SA80, for example. You can cut that barrel down to make the weapon shorter. Of course you can do that. That will reduce the ballistic potential of the round that you'd, you've already chosen. You're changing the parameters, you're making something else. You can successfully do that, but um, by some schools of thought, it's better to, do, to design something from scratch that is short. And if you want that long barrel, moving it back into the gun and moving the grip forward is the way to achieve that. So, so that's why. Uh, back to the terminology. Um, so stockless um, is because in, in the British mindset, you are eliminating the butt from the rifle. So the, quickly skip back. So um, the one on the top there, conventional design, got a butt stock on it, goes into the shoulder. That's how you aim the thing. With a bullpup, an orthodox stockless firearm, in, to their way of thinking, you remove the butt. Um, so they call it buttless, stockless. Um, so, that's, the, that's so much for the terminology. Um, oh, incidentally, the um, uh, Winston Churchill, who gets involved much later in the story, the lack of a buttstock was one of the reasons he personally didn't like the 1950s EM2 rifle that I'm going to be talking about later, because you couldn't clobber people with it, <laughs> um, which is a reality of, of combat, of course. Um, he said, uh, about, about the design we ended up with, which I'll come to. It has a butt, remember that. It is very important when one has no ammunition left to have a butt on one's rifle. Which I think is quite a nice quote. Um, so the first of the bullpups that we identified, the earliest, so we, we may not have coined the term bullpup, that, that came from the Americans incidentally, defin definitively, and we didn't use it really until much, much later. But we, as the British, did in fact, come up with the first one, as far as we know. Uh, before I go on, I should just name check the, um, the Curtis rifle, uh, which is a very interesting thing, but for me, it didn't quite fit um, uh, the, the British narrative for reasons that will become clear if you read. Uh, it is in the book. I recommend you seek out an article by my um, friend and contact, Matthew Moss, who has written a very good piece on the Curtis rifle. It's very, very unusual, not just in terms of being a, a bullpup. And this is, that's 1860s, 1866. The thing in front of you now is earlier than that, um, a date of 1864 was assigned to it in the article that I um, encountered. I, the, the maker is a little uncertain on this, Riviere, is it, is it, um, uh, with me is it Henry Riviere or is it his uh, father Isaac who was active obviously earlier on so this is if you haven't if you're probably puzzling over what the hell this thing is it is a muzzle loader so you still you've still got to load your powder and bullet from the front and ram it in, in uh, into place with the rammer that's mounted below the barrel as you can see there 
the only muzzle loading bullpup rifle that I've uh, come across in this research. Um, and you can see it almost gets across the idea a little, a little easier um, in that you can see the lock mechanism. It's, we're, we're familiar in, in antique firearms with the idea of a lock. And you can see that it's on the outside of the gun. It's just right at the back. It couldn't be more bullpup, really. The barrel, as you can see in the lower image, goes all the way almost to the rear. And there's a, a not buttstock for the shoulder. What is this thing? Why would somebody foreshorten a gun in the bullpup fashion in either the 1850s, if it's Henry Riviere, but, uh, both working in London, incidentally, these, these makers, or um, the 60s, if, it, if it's his son. We can't bottom that one out, unfortunately. Um, well, it's a, it's a what we now call a bench rest target rifle. Um, and we have to, we can only really guess at what the intent of the uh, owner was, because this was a commission piece um, made for, uh, or, well, owned by, we can't be certain that he commissioned it, but I suspect he probably did. Richard Potter was his name, um, professor of natural philosophy and astronomy at UCL, University College London. Um, it's now at the National Rifle Association Museum at Bisley Camp, the UK National Rifle Association. Um, he, inter interestingly, this is, uh, Potter wrote an, an elementary treatise on optics in two volumes, 1847 and 1851. So um, round about perhaps a little bit before he got the rifle and uh, an elementary treatise on mechanics in 1848. So he didn't write anything on firearms. He wasn't a firearms guy per se, but um, he obviously enjoyed the hobby of target shooting and appropriate that he wrote books on optics because as you can see, this is fitted with an optical sight, a telescopic sight. You can see the trigger just hanging below there, no trigger guard. There was at one time a trigger guard. So I've probably talked a bit too long about that one, but as the first British bullpup ever, it probably deserved it. We'll, we'll move uh, forward uh, to the, the, the next um, important moment in British bullpup history, um, which is most people I'm sure will recognize the Lee Enfield rifles. On the top, we've got the, the Long Lee, um, um, 1895 that's introduced, 303 caliber bolt action rifle, um, used in, in the, during the South African War, Second South African War. And then on the bottom, the lessons learned from that, from the Boer War, led to a shortened, improved version of the so-called Long uh, Lee Enfield. They, they were really looking here at the beginning of, arguably, the beginning of small unit tactics, um, use of co cover and concealment, loose open formations, um, really drawing on um, the light infantry tactics of, of earlier periods, but sort of rolling that out across the whole army or starting to, at least in this campaign. And it was recognized that rapid aimed fire or thought, thought that rapid aimed fire was the way forward. So rather than standing shoulder to shoulder, uh, we've, we've abandoned the bright red tunics by this point, but nonetheless, lots, lots of close formation work still being done early on. And then by the end of the war, we realize what we need is the rifle, the powerful, um, smokeless powder, long range, accurate, rapid fire rifle has, is starting to open out the battlefield and a small unit in cover can cause serious trouble for a, for a larger, better equipped, perhaps, um, British unit, um, the bottom of the, the hill or whatever. That's, that's the sort of uh, received wisdom of, of what comes out of the Boer War. So. We can make it shorter, therefore lighter, therefore more pointable, good for snap shooting. So if, if a man runs across at 200 yards, you can bring the rifle to bear and, and hit him perhaps more easily. Sights brought closer together um, uh, and open sights so you can hopefully see, see the target you're aiming at more easily in that sort of more dynamic modern combat shooting style and charger loading so that you can get five rounds into the gun with one action, rather than just pressing a single round into the magazine one after the other. So those are the key improvements of the SMLE. 
What's not particularly widely known is it had a, a rival briefly um, and it was a bullpup and that's what's in the middle of this this picture that is the Thornycroft patent rifle which emerges in 1901 and the first ones are made we think in 1902 and we have uh, a number of them in the collection I have a, a, a long form article on this um, with lots and lots of detail on the Thornycroft in the Arms and Armour Journal if anyone would care to, to look that out and it will feature heavily in the book as well and I'll have to scamper on past it fairly soon because of time concerns, but it's it's quite a, a key rifle for, for me. You can see again, the working parts are, are well to the rear, um, certainly of the trigger. Hard to identify the grip on this because of the um, the way these um, Thorny Croft and Farker, who's the, we think the real inventor here, I'll, I'll mention them in, again in a moment, contrived to for the hand to fit behind the, the trigger guard there's not there's not a you can see there's a curve there for the back of the hand to rest there's there's a defined grasping area but traditional rifles didn't have a pistol grip so it's a little little harder to get your head around at first you can see the bolt handle laying flat against the receiver there or against the stock and the bolt itself well well back so where, whereas on the on the end fields there's nothing there but wood on this design there's a lot of working parts to the rear uh, right under your cheek. So why the Thornycroft? Well, um, whereas the SMLE was conceived as a universal short rifle for all combat troops, because it wouldn't, it wouldn't just be good for um, modern infantry tactics, it would also be handy for uh, rear echelon troops, um, artillerymen could lay aside pistols or and, and go to a short rifle as well. Pretty much everyone can get along with a a short rifle like the SMLE, and that's the way it goes in the first half of the 20th century. The Germans follow follow suit with, well, I say follow suit, do their own thing. With a short rifle, the Americans adopt a short rifle as well. So that's the compromise made there. Um, the Thornycroft comes from a more specific uh, theoretical remit um, of um, arming the, the mounted infantry so in the in the Boer War, there were uh, there were cavalry units, but there were also mounted infantry units, and they think of them as the the dragoons of the 17th century, brought up to date, modern equipment, um, but they they ride to battle, jump off, fight as infantry, get back on, and, and away they go. So um, the, the the Thornycroft was conceived to arm the mounted infantry. Of course. Why wouldn't that also work for for conventional infantry and for other troops as well? So this is offered to the war office as a potential uh, new rifle, perhaps little realizing that the SMLE was already a done deal essentially by 1902. Um, I don't think the designers were fully aware of that. Um, speaking of the designers, that's Mubri Gore Farker, um, who goes on to work on the Farker Hill rifle, if anyone's heard of that, and the Beardmore Farker machine gun. He's somewhat prolific, somewhat uh, you know, a capable known designer of firearms. James Baird Thornycroft, uh, an industrialist, was more the investor, the, the um, patron. Uh, it's not clear what direct design involvement he had, but he did have a brother who um, had his own regiment, Thornycroft's Mounted Infantry. So there, there was definitely a, a what we might now call a user requirement for a bullpup rifle, or so they thought. So moving on. This develops into a series of rifles, um, uh, which I've dubbed lazily first, second, and third pattern, and you see them here. And then Thornycroft and, and or Farker also used the term model 1906 and model 1907 for the altered versions. And you can see quite a few changes happen during the development of this and um, dig out the article or, or email me um, if you'd like more details on, on the technical detail of this, because I won't have time to go into that today, unfortunately. Um, you can see on the later version, we've got this wooden cheek piece. Um, oh, sorry guys, I have uh, failed to move on. Here we go. So first, second, third, patterns from the top down, a wooden cheek piece to basically stop you from having to put your face on the hot, um, not very comfortable bolt. 
but you're still going to have to move your head away from the rifle as you operate the bolt, which is which you famously don't have to do with the with the Enfield rifle, one of the fastest bolt action rifles to operate if you if you have enough training and experience to 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 um, operate it quickly, which the British Army eventually did, and then lost that unfortunately due to uh, losses in the First World War. Anyway, yeah, so it changed quite drastically over. The, over its development, the, the, the first, second, and third don't share any parts in common. Um, these are all 303 caliber, incidentally. So very much being pushed as a service rifle ca uh, candidate. A couple of remarks on the trials, because this did make it to evaluation trials, I think we should call it. Um, so the, the commandant at the School of Musketry at Hythe commented, the rifles are light and handle well, and the principle of curtailing the length of the rifle while securing the full length of the barrel has much to recommend it. And that's probably the most important quote that I came across in all of my research um, for, this, for this book, because that applies to almost any bullpup ever made, whether it's one being worked on right now, or almost certainly that target rifle from the 1850s, 60s. Um, which uh, incidentally, I, I have to speculate um, that was made short to make it easier to work around and load on a bench. That throw back to a previous slide, but that, that's my thinking on that. Answers on a postcard or in the in the comments. And they, however, didn't go well in trials. Unfortunately, um, found to have more recoil, slow to load because the the Enfield had moved on to this charger loading system of a clip of five rounds. It had a heavy trigger with inconsistent pull off. Was found to have a lower rate of fire, less reliable. Accuracy was comparable, but no better. In fact, slightly worse at some distances. So um, Farker and Thornycroft ask for feedback and they're denied feedback. So it's not a good sign. That doesn't stop them. And they, admit, they um, submit a, um, the third pattern, as you can see on the screen, which is less radical in design, I think, and is actually less of a bullpup by the definition that I came up with. Um, arguably not one, in fact. And the, the rather passive aggressive response received was the committee inspected the rifle and asked that Mr. Farker be thanked for exhibiting it. Not, not, for, not really a rigging endorsement. A very brief mention for time, unfortunately, of the Godsall rifle, which is covered more in, in the book. It emerges at almost the same time and has its own series of patents that cover it. And it's, it's very similar in, in all, um, Major details, it's the same really as the, as the Thornycroft, but to, to, our, to those of us that study these things, it's different in every detail. The key differences I think are in where the magazine is located. So this is even less of a bullpup. This is, this is pushing it well, pushing the definition beyond breaking point actually, in order I think to make the connection between the trigger and the um, sear, the thing that fires the gun, lets the striker fly forward and fire the cartridge, a short, and as direct as possible. You see this throughout bullpup development by putting the trigger so far forward from where the working parts are, you inevitably need something like, and this is how it's often done later, a wire <laughs> connecting the trigger to the action. And you pull, a, you pull a trigger, the wire pulls on the mechanism and fires it. Not ideal for an accurate shot where you want a smooth, short, crisp travel of the trigger. So um, marks, marksmen tend to tend to not favour the bullpups. So th this is um, Major Philip Thomas Godsall's take, uh, another uh, military connected man, actually in the military this time, um, based on his experience, but primarily his experience on the target shooting range, I think. Uh, both of these designs were seem to have gone down quite well at Bisley. I don't think actual current serving or at least the small arms committee, whose job it was to assess these things, were particularly impressed overall by either of them. This was dispensed with in even uh, shorter order, actually. Um, find you the quote on that. So the small arms committee reported, and let me just, so this is the second, there are two patterns of Godsall. Um, this is the, a version of the second pattern and that weird flanged, grip at the back is how you hold it you cup it in your hand not ideal um, and that's where the magazine is is housed that's why that's so bulky and, and so awkward you'll notice the very short bolt those of you with a technical uh, mind will, will note that it's short short travel so it's quite quick to, to cycle and it's very robust some of the interest in 
uh, Godsaw's work was not the bullpup rifle, it was the action around about the time of the two, um, 276 um, experimental Enfield round. There was some interest in that, but very little in his actual bullpup. And they say the committee considered that this rifle undoubtedly has some good points and the action appears a strong one. Uh, but apart from the defects mentioned, um, the impossibility of loading without removing the rifle from the shoulder. So uh, again, you have to drop it out of the shoulder to reload it. And the apparent difficulty of fixing an aperture sight uh, without four and a half inches of the eye make the rifle unsuitable for further consideration. So we leave the Edwardian period um, and go straight into the 1940s, which is where things start to get interesting. I'm going to scamper through these very quickly, these first few, because they, they don't, they're not as significant as what will come. So there's a 1944, a couple of important designs emerge. And there's incidentally, there's no, there doesn't appear to be any institutional awareness back to the Thornycroft and the Godsall here. This is this is as though we're reinventing the wheel. And then again, that happens later on as well. That everyone seems to, to, to want to believe that they're the first to do this. But anyway, so the armament design department um, of the Ministry of Supply, part of the government, working for the War Office effectively. We come up with the sniper rifle experimental, or the SREM, as, as I tend to call it. And this is this is using the bullpup idea um, to facilitate the weird cocking grip on this design. So it's missing its scope. It should have a scope on it. It's a future snipe, futuristic sniper rifle for 1944. And the idea is there are two ways to achieve rapid sniper sniping shots, as it were, um, what we might call designated marksman rifles today. One is the self-loading rifle. So the rifle fires every time you pull the trigger. And that's the way things went, uh, had already gone in some ways. The slightly quirky British approach was, well, we'll, we'll make it a, um, a grip cocking design. So you can keep it in the shoulder, you can keep your, your sight picture of, of what you're aiming at and you cock it with the grip. And to facilitate that, they design it as a bullpup. So that one's an interesting one, but um, that's not the thrust of this. Ammunition, we need to quickly cover, um, ideally we'd, we cover it more, but uh, time is short. We in the Second World War, as this this vintage display from the collection shows, uh, we have the 303 British cartridge. It's old, it's rimmed, which doesn't work well in self-loading designs. So alongside the development of the bullpup, now we have the self-loading and the automatic rifle, which are key to the future of infantry combat. And indeed, both the Americans on the right hand side, the .30 there, or 30 caliber and the 7.92 German uh, cartridge, they are both rimless. So straight sided head of the cartridge feeds more easily in a um, modern mechanism, a uh, self-acting mechanism. And they're also arguably ballistically better than the old, um, uh, well, not really much older to be honest, but the um, British cartridge, slightly lower velocity. Um, so the, the war office dilly dally slightly between do we adopt a stopgap round and if we do will it be the German round which we're making in Britain so it's easily accessible um, or the American round thinking about standardizing with um, America our, our major ally and supplier of, of military kit and, uh, during the second world war standardization with our allies becomes very very important in this story later um, and then on the right hand side we have the, the 792 uh, short round also from Germany that is examples are captured during the war and Britain and lots of other countries look at this and go that's a very good idea lighter shorter lower recoil impulse is the key thing here at this point it's what enables what we now know as the assault rifle um, something you can fire very very rapidly automatically in fact in an arguably controllable way so every man is carrying something that's basically a submachine gun and a rifle that becomes key later on. So bear this in mind as we move on. And very quickly, the favored self-loading rifle that might fire the German round when we're thinking we might have a German, the German round is the self-loading rifle experimental model. And the designer of this, who's Belgian, um, Saif is his name, goes back to Belgium later and develops a very important series of rifles. And spoiler alert, we end up adopting that. Not this rifle, but a, uh, a later design of, of his. This this goes by the board. Um, there's a war on. Uh, we're not ready to adopt a self-loading rifle just yet, and we revisit after the war. 
Uh, one more from 1944, the Hall rifle. Um, I'll have to move on because we're going to be short, but um, intriguing design. Key thing here, apart from being a bullpup, it's designed to throw the empty cases directly up and over the shooter's shoulder because one of the criticisms of the bullpup, which becomes important when it's a self-loading design, is the cases get thrown out of the gun quite forcefully and you don't want those hitting you in the face. So this was an early attempt to solve that, an Australian design, British Commonwealth, but an Australian designer, Eric Mouncey Hall. Uh, there's also the Bernie rifle, uh, very, very slightly later on, um, using this very interesting um, perforated bleeding cartridge that allows a sort of um, ramping up of pressure that, that gives you very high velocity. That was the idea. And he factored that into a bullpup concept, did not go anywhere. Very, very quickly, just to give us another hint of the Commonwealth here, in 1944, um, the uh, future Maharaja um, Singh, uh, visible in, on the left of that, that image there from our archive, invents his own sort of civilian take on a, on a bullpup. Uh, 2 2 caliber sporting rifle essentially and he's showing that to um, Lord Mountbatten among other senior British military types. I don't think there's a link up there but it's an interesting footnote and an interesting piece of history. Another Australian design the Russell Robinson SR9 designed as it's a very it's a 50 caliber anti-aircraft anti-vehicle weapon essentially it doesn't again doesn't really go anywhere but interesting. So the main um, some of the stars of the show the uh, Roman Corsac, who um, was uh, one of the, uh, or part of the, the armament design establishment, as it's been renamed at this time, can get quite confusing, but um, this is the idea of a um, light automatic gun. So one of the concepts coming out of the Second World War is that the, the Bren, is great we like the bren gun light machine gun it's portable dynamic you it's it's the base of the british infantry squad's firepower what if we make make that even lighter more compact and easy to use veering a bit towards the assault rifle but but something more capable longer range as a support weapon and that's the light automatic gun and meeting that requirement was this prototype um which is also a bullpup so uh, uh, Corsac was a pole. Um, several of these inventors are from different sections of the ADE who were um, refugees from, from the advance of Nazi Germany. Um, we don't know much about Corsac, unfortunately, um, but uh, he probably was involved in the design of, of the Polston aircraft, anti-aircraft gun, if anyone has uh, come across that. Very, very briefly, we talked about the trigger linkage problem of bullpups briefly. Um, this solved it in a really intriguing way. Um, the, the base of the gun is a 792 um, German Mauser cartridge again. The design is very close in many ways to that of the FG42 paratrooper rifle, which was an, another sort of do it all rifle, submachine gun rifle, maybe even light machine gun. And so we veer toward the light machine gun role here. Um, it's made a full bullpup, so instead of the magazine sticking out the side, it's behind the grip. And a very interesting sliding, I've marked it here with, with an arrow uh, on the next slide. There, so that, it's hard to make out, I know, but there's a piece there that allows a very solid linkage between trigger and the mechanism behind. So they're, they're really thinking about how to solve this, this problem. Unfortunately, that very design gave it problems functioning, um, which we won't go into, but um, it didn't matter because thinking was already shifting at this time to what I've already spoken about, replacing uh, at the top there. This, these, are, these are Second World War weapons, rifle, light machine gun and submachine gun or machine carbine in British, replacing them all with one weapon. And that full power light machine gun type gun didn't really fit that mold. For that, we're going to need our own version of the 792 Kurtz German short assault rifle cartridge. And what they come up with, which you'll see a picture of later, a bit later on, is the 280 
cartridge, which um, we, we would have a medium machine gun chambered in that, and we'd have a an automatic rifle, which I think today we can legitimately look at as an assault rifle, at least until later on, um, for reasons I might ex I'll explain later. Um, that fires the same cartridge. So we're looking at standardizing on a brand new British cartridge that is more sensible for the for the common for the modern battlefield. Big powerful cartridges like 303, 30 caliber, 792 Mauser are accurate and capable out to 500,000 yards perhaps depending on what you're trying to do. The 280 is more like the German assault rifle cartridge. All most combat is taking place up to 300 meters is the lesson learned from World War II, um, although not by everybody. So this is just a period drawing showing the relative capabilities. Um, the first of two rifles designed to fire this, the um, EM1, Experimental Model 1, by a, uh, a British designer called Thorpe. This is using stamped metal construction, which is something we've sort of been inspired by um, German activity to do. It's once once you're tooled up for it, it's cheap, it's quick, it's light, well, potentially lightweight, but not always. Um, but you can see that the bullpup concept is now entrenched pretty much in British small arms design. Here, here's a, an earlier prototype of it split into its component or into its major assemblies. It looks simple. Trust me when I tell you it's actually extremely complex, expensive to make, difficult to maintain in the field, as I think this <laughs> uh, explains. Just, I love these, these period manual images that show you uh, guys in essentially Second World War kit using what look like very futuristic weapons. I'm just a fan of those, so I've put that in there to show you quickly. A new bayonet is designed for both of these rifles, and sharp-eyed among you will see that that is not the EM-1, that is the EM-2, um, designed by uh, uh, a pole called um, Januszewski, who uh, Stefan Kenneth Jansen is his anglicised name, because I imagine he had terrible problems with people mispronouncing his name, as I probably just did. Both of these come out in 1947, by the way. This one is perhaps the best known, other than the SA-80, that I'll finish with. The bottom one is a paratrooper version. Essentially, it's just cut down. Um, but it's a very long barrel in the EM2, thanks to that ballpark design. So you can afford to cut the barrel down. Um, a better design, I think, subjectively, than the, um, than the EM1. Machined out of solid metal, so not perhaps as forward thinking in some ways, but more achievable in the 1950s to actually make this thing if it went forward. An optical sight, but it's not magnified. And it is really just to compensate for the very short length of the rifle. Because if you have iron sights, if they're very close together, it enhances uh, errors of accuracy. So a single optical sight way of aiming was a replacement for an, op for an aperture sight, if you know your iron sights. Here it is, uh, stripped down. Easy to maintain and stripped down. Um, but the bolt assembly contains more than a dozen parts and is um, really complex actually, complex and expensive to make. Here's Janssen fire, showing one minor advantage of the bullpup rifle, the ability to fire one-handed. Very few photos of these inventors, so I was glad to include this one. Um, here's the short, uh, both versions of the EM2 alongside, again, spoiler alert, what ends up beating it is what becomes the FNFAL, and that is then known as the, the uh, universal carbine, not fitted with their magazines in this photo, but it shows you the, the, the one definitive advantage of the EM2, a short overall length. A photo from trials from, from rather later on, you can see from 1947 to 1953, this thing was under, under continuous development, although uh, it didn't quite pan out. This is it, it actually uh, is adopted it's the first bullpup rifle to be adopted by a military anywhere in 1951 as rifle number nine. But uh, to cut another long story short, four months later, it's effectively unadopted. Um, the <laughs> the uh, Labour government in power uh, are, are keen to get behind British industry and promote this um, indigenous design. But 
politics are kind of intervening at this point. So America is not a fan of this reduced power cartridge at all. It's not really a fan of the rifle either. America, Britain, Canada, Belgium, the major, the major national forces want to standardize ideally if they can. Um, and so Amer America sort of leans towards the Belgian FN, FAL design, but really all along they've wanted to favor their own development of their M1 Garand rifle. They want to keep their own shortened version of their 30 caliber cartridge, which becomes the 7.62 NATO cartridge. And Britain is effectively bulldozed into ditching the rifle. That's a very, the very short version um, of that much longer and, and very interesting story. Um, just a quick diagram uh, or a design drawing showing you the, the working parts of the EM2. Here are some of those cartridges. So early experimental 270 becomes the 280, which gets tweaked. And then there's this desperate struggle to try to meet American requirements for a longer range, more powerful cartridge without ruining this idea of a controllable automatic weapon. And it ends with 7.62 NATO at the end, which, which as you can see is bigger and it's more powerful and you cannot re reasonably fire it on automatic in uh, what we call the British, or we called the machine carbine role, i.e. like a submachine gun, like an assault rifle. And here are the two rivals. The, the fully developed FNFAL in its adopted in 1954 um, L1A1 form on the top there. That's actually uh, the first one ever made that we have. And below that, the X2E1, which is what the EM2 was developed into in 7.62. As in Britain, we're all fervently hoping that even though it's no longer really an assault rifle, we'll still go ahead and adopt this new version instead of rifle number nine. We don't uh, for reasons of cost. Uh, for reasons of um, FN um, in Belgium being able to tool up and give us 5,000 troop trials rifles. They leapfrog ahead when actually the two rifles had been very close together and the EM2 was better in some ways. So we could debate this uh, with those interested for a long time, but we must move on. And then the final stretch of the story, which I'll have to rattle through now, sorry. Um, the What was called variously, but... Um, uh, one of its major names, the 485 or 485 millimeter Enfield weapon system. So another um, in-house design like the EM2 was, another generation on. So the EM2 has failed, the um, FNFAL is adopted and widely loved actually by the troops, regardless of being about a foot longer than the EM2, it does everything else that the EM2 did. Perfectly good choice. We could afford to make more of them and equip the whole army with them. We may not have been able to do that with the EM2. In retrospect, it's probably the right choice. Anyway, so this is the beginning of the SA-80 and alongside EWS is this designation of SA-80, small arms for the 1980s. So we're in the very beginning of the 1970s and we're looking at the future of the next decade or so, what we'll replace the um, SLR with. And the assault rifle as a concept has moved on to something called um, small caliber high velocity where we get the 5.56 millimeter cartridge from. But Britain decides to go its own way on this. And we come up with these prototypes in 1975-ish. The rifle on the top there, the individual weapon, and a light machine gun or light support weapon, as it was called uh, below, it's missing its optical sight there. There's that ballpark configuration. This uses the coat hanger style wire to connect the trigger to the mechanism, which is one of many things that's not very inspiring about the um, early SA-80 at least. Uh, very briefly, here's a study diagram from, from one of those reports showing conventional designs. So the, the existing rifle on top, the M16 below it, which was the gold standard already in 1971 for a modern service rifle. And then different British concepts for the rifle. And then on the right, the light support weapon. Some wooden mock-ups, which we have in the collection that we used to assess uh, the rifle and the grenade system that would go along with this, which I uh, won't get into now. This all led up to trials in 1978 and nine of the 485 caliber ammunition that Britain was putting forward for the whole of NATO to adopt. Again, this is all about standardization and the weapons. And this is a manual that was produced in um, uh, English and German 
for the, the troops that would be running these weapons and ammunition in the trial. And so we've come from now, uh, 303 on the left there, through these other types with the sort of failed um, 280 or seven millimeter to, we're already using the M16 and 5.56 in a limited basis, by the way, on a limited basis, to the 485 round on the right. And you'll see, you can probably guess that that, it's hard to see, well, probably can't, it's probably not fair to say, but it is derived from 5.56. So that came first, that was already a sound cartridge. Small bullet, lightweight, long enough to have enough mass to still hit people and stop them fighting, but flat shooting, low recoil, it's the modern assault rifle cartridge following on from the earlier attempts like the German 792 and the British 280. And the 485 is Britain's attempt to sort of finesse that into something even better. And another long story short, it doesn't really do that. It, it's, the trials suggest it's ever so slightly more penetrative at, at, at range, but not enough to be worth uh, considering over the 556, which already exists, essentially. Um, so, so the SA-80 is redesigned for 5.56, uh, but that's not the main reason for the differences we see here. The top version is the original um, designed by Sidney Hans, who had worked on the EM2 program as a junior. Um, and the bottom one is the recognizably, I think, the SA-80 in its sort of middle form. The main change in, the, in looks here is to do with value engineering, which is a term will be familiar to, to some of you, I suspect where you try to redesign something you've come up with to be cost effective enough to actually make. And that reduced, that, that, that turned this quite lightweight, quite svelte looking design into a boxy, heavy bit of a boat anchor um, of a rifle and a light support weapon. A new bayonet, because the bayonet is still seen to be worth having. It's a socket bayonet, throwback to the, to the 18th century in a way, cast, Steel, not very strong, not a great design. Uh, and here's the, the light support weapon version in use in 1985-ish. And here, here common, common to this is the same set of working parts. So here they are stripped uh, perfectly fine. The, the AR-15, more so the AR-18 and think other designs, G36. It's a sound enough concept for a modern weapon. The problem is in, um, well, arguably in, in the ergonomics of the design and as certainly in the execution of the actual manufacture of it. The Enfield factory was not experienced in modern stamped steel and plastic manufacture. It was faced with closure later on in the program as well, which didn't help. Quality control was poor. Deadlines were tight. Money was tight. You ended up in 1985 with a really not very good weapon, unfortunately. Um, but in the late 90s, Heckler and Koch in Germany, who are owned by the British Aerospace, who have, this, who have inherited the SA-80, are brought on board and they essentially redesign the L85A1 and the L86A1 very slightly in every important way in terms of working parts to actually work. Not that the rifle didn't work, but it was prone to stoppages uh, and, and potentially to critical stoppages that would take the weapon out of the fight entirely. So it went from being a very poor weapon in adverse conditions with bits that were early on that would just drop off and weren't well made to apparent, as, as all, the, all the data points to it being the most reliable rifle in NATO right now. I think I can say that legitimately. Um, the MOD like to talk about it being the most accurate as well. I think it's no more accurate than, say, an M full length barrel M16 or something of that nature. It's a perfectly good rifle, but we have bought it three times over now. Um, <laughs> because there is at the bottom of this image the A3. So by this point, the light support weapon, which was always fraught with difficulty in terms of how do we actually make use of this big, he even heavier thing that's basically a rifle on steroids is binned and we now just have L85A3 but we also still have L85A2 in service and for the foreseeable future it's a bit like um, George Washington's um, shovel ship of Theseus triggers a broom <laughs> if you recognize that reference we can continue to have new parts made and potentially have an A3 and A4 
whether whether the British will go that way or whether a new off the shelf replacement that's a conventional rifle like an M4 type rifle, whether which of those will happen, anyone's guess, but there is no out of service date for the SA-80. I think I've already overrun, so I will leave it there and let any further discussion come from the questions. I hope that I hope you enjoyed that. I did set myself rather a monumental task of scampering through 100 years of history in 40 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Jonathan. That was uh, that was really interesting. And quite a few questions have come in. So if you'll allow me, what I'll do is I'll read them out for you. And if you're OK to cover what you can, that would be great. Of course. Um, so the first one in the chat came from Owen, which was, was the Thornycroft made by the vehicle or a powerboat company? Excellent question. No, <laughs> it's a different spelling, actually. Um, there's, there's an EY in Thornycroft, the rifle. Uh, it's just a coincidence. Okay, thank you. Uh, I thought the same when I first encountered it. The next one was from Joe. Uh, why do you think bullpups have fallen out of favor in recent years in terms of military use like the French going with the HK416 as a replacement for the FAMAS? Yeah, very good question. Um, it's, I think the, the answer is, is hidden in the presentation I've just given. It's a niche, really a niche weapon. It was a niche weapon when it started, target shooting initially, and incidentally, um, by the time it's named the bullpup in the 1930s, it's still being used as a target rifle. Normal rifles, hunting, sporting, target shooting type rifles are being converted into bullpup designs for more convenience in target shooting. So it was a niche weapon to begin with. It was a niche weapon when it was a prototype, when it was a series of prototypes in World War II and, and afterwards. It becomes mainstream in the 70s and 80s when Britain, France, uh, Australia, New Zealand um, and a couple of other uh, major forces adopt bullpup rifles, China later as well, importantly, but it never becomes dominant. Um, and at the end of the day, it's just another, it, it doesn't drastically change the capability of the weapon. It's just a bit shorter, that's all. And with that comes some ergonomic shortfalls, which I think is what your inquirer is getting at. So as well as the, the poor trigger that tends to come with these linkages between the trigger and the mechanism, you, um, left and right-handed uh, people, sorry, left-handed people can't use most bullpups, although there are design ways around that uh, to make them fireable from either shoulder. In the British Army, everyone's taught to fire from the right shoulder. And if you need to fire from the other shoulder, if you're leaning around a corner of a house or something uh, fighting, you have to pull your head up away from the action so it doesn't hit you in the face. Um, people have lost teeth from the cocking handle moving back and forth. And at the very least, it's a distraction getting hot brass in the face. So, and then the SA-80 is a great example of ergonomic shortfalls. Moving everything to the back means you've got to reach back to remove a magazine, replace a magazine, operate the parts. Now, again, um, the, Israeli, the Israelis have come up with some great workarounds for a lot of these ergonomic shortfalls. And I looked into the ergonomics thing for the book and the only scientific studies that have been done don't seem to find the same issues that a lot of military people, enthusiasts, authors like to, to come up with. Does it really matter if a weapon is one second slower to load, if you're meant to be behind cover anyway? Discuss. But yeah, there, there are all sorts of... For all of those reasons, they've fallen out of favor. The other side of the story is that conventional rifles that are shorter have become more viable. So the M4 is the sort of vanguard of that movement. Take the, the long M16, you redesign it to be shorter, you then redesign the ammunition to be more capable to catch up with that. And why wouldn't you just have that? What does the bullpup offer that a short rifle doesn't? So we're back to that um, SMLE idea, really. Um, meaning it's going to come down to what comes through trials that's best. And if it happens to be a bullpup, you'll end up with a bullpup. But the majority of rifles in existence aren't bullpups. So chances are you won't end up with one. And if the British go to trials again, we probably won't end up with one. Sorry, very long answer to a complex question. Yeah, I think that hopefully that covers it. Loads of questions are coming in now, Jonathan. So um there are some really interesting things. Uh, so this next one's from Greg. Um, was the gas piston system ever in question for its reliability 
as so many incredibly reliable rifles now seem to all be gas piston. Um, it's all, it goes on. So for example, 416, etc. cetera. Um, and will the doctrine change the design of the weapon in future years? I'll leave it there because there's some more in that. Yeah. Question. Okay. So the, um, what is, what they're getting at there is the, so the, the, the star conventional rifle in the West is the M16 AR-15 series, which doesn't have this reciprocating gas piston to operate it. Uh, makes it lighter, um, makes it less reliable in certain use cases. Um, but for, for your average army, it's not really a problem. Um, but it's intrinsic to that design. And if, you're, if your weapon isn't designed to not have that piston, it's going to default to one of these piston operated designs which are well proven you know back to the uh, the 30s in the 90 well earlier than that they exist earlier than that but by the 1930s these short stroke pistons are absolutely fine fine pretty much metallurgy is not what it is today so they're still less reliable than now but essentially now it's a choice of um do you want an m16 style rifle in which case you probably won't have this feature uh if yes then you won't have it. <laughs> if no, you will have it because everything else uses it. And it's it's bomb proof reliable reliability wise. And that's why it got grafted back onto the M16, in my view, for marketing purposes, um, because the M16 is fine for the HK416 that's mentioned there. As to will doctrine change uh, the shape of the rifle, bullpup or not, it might. Um, this is where it kind of where it originated in military circles with the with the mounted infantry idea and the the current uh us squad weapon trials include one family of bullpups uh, an automatic weapon and a rifle and uh, light machine gun support type thing and a rifle and that is in order to to accommodate a new doctrine change that the us army are wanting a bullet that will penetrate chinese or russian because that's really what it's about, in theory, hopefully, body armour at a certain long distance. That requires huge chamber pressure. Um, and to develop that chamber pressure, one of the designers have come up with a long barrel in a short package, a bullpup. So that's a case of modern doctrine influencing us back toward the bullpup. I can't see that necessarily going anywhere. So the, the, the big answer is no, with a qualifier of it could. <laughs> Thank you. There's um <clears throat> sorry. There's another one from Greg here actually. Um, was there ever a reason given that it took so long to adopt a grenade launcher with the SA80? Oh, excellent question. Yeah. So what what I didn't have time to sort of spell out there was that um, an area effect weapon, a grenade launcher, really, was factored into SA80 from the very beginning. Hence those wooden mock-up photos that I showed you. It had been factored into the EM2 and the EM1 back in the late forties as well. Um, the idea, this goes back to the First World War, the idea that as well as grenades you can throw for short range, you want something you can place at longer range that's fired off a gun. So that's, that's well understood by this point. And even in 1971, they're looking at an under barrel grenade launcher because the Americans are successfully using them in Vietnam by that point on M16s. So um, you'd expect in 1985, the rifle the individual weapon SA-80 to be introduced with an underbowel grenade launcher. Why the heck not? And they just couldn't manage it. Um, so there was no official reason given. Um, I don't think FOI requests were, were, were really a thing then. So um, it was just parked and trials carried on in the background. They had enough trouble getting the weapons functioning to actually introduce them. Eight years delayed or whatever it ended up being. They were they didn't have time to worry about um, under barrel grenade launchers, but to be fair, um, they had already decided they'd go with rifle grenades, things that slip over the barrel of the gun and are fired off First World War style, but more sophisticated. And that's what those mock ups uh, that, I, that I posted um, relate to. So we had rifle grenades. In fact, there's a, a photo um, of the only combat um use of a rifle grenade that i that i could find from the gulf of a guy fi having just fired a rifle grenade at an iraqi uh, armored personnel carrier so as late as 91 we're, we're still that they're looking at under barrel grenade launchers but we haven't got one yet so we're still using rifle grenades you don't see huge use but they are out there in the gulf certainly 
And then by the turn of the century, we're back to, with H&K on board, we are back to rifle grenades again, and we get the underbarrel grenade launcher in 2001, I think it was, that we should have had probably in 1985. So no official answer, no. FOI? <laughs> Don't mention me if you do. <laughs> Thanks. Um... Next one's from uh, Mark. Um, any reported safety incidents with bullpups with action closer to the operator's face? And, and later on, he said also ejection pattern up and away versus off to the side with the bullpup. Yeah, so there's one case of an EM2 in Australia that blew up, um, which is seems to have been um, excess pressure, bad ammunition. Um, not not inherent to the to the design, and there's no indication that the firer was badly hurt, which is you know it's always hard to prove a negative, but um, no suggestion there that the action being next to the face was a huge problem. That's it. Um, I didn't I didn't dig really hard into looking for I didn't do any FOI requests to look into SA80 accidents, but I'm not aware of any. I've, I've heard some or read. Um, some some anecdotes of um, well no no not even that for the SA80 to be honest they relate to the cocking handle and brass in the face so no I mean modern firearms proof tested properly designed and made I mean how many how how often does a breech explosion happen even in a conventional rifle not saying they couldn't happen in a bullpup they can and they will I'm sure but um, you've still got quite a lot of structure around the bolt. And it's on the other side of the weapon. So if it goes, the chances of something serious happening to your face, I would say, are, are, are slim. But if anyone knows different, please let us know. Um, can't go into the book now, but um, I will definitely be interested. Um, the only other case I know of of, of this happening is the XM25 uh, Punisher grenade launcher uh, sensor fuse grenade launcher that was trialed in Afghanistan and there was there was an injury there but then you're talking about a grenade round going off with a lot more propellant a lot I don't think I don't know if I hope that the main charge the grenade didn't go off um, and then that's an experimental weapon being trialed in the field so no, it's not it's overstated I would say although I have various references from from the different types I've outlined here of people saying I, sh I should not like to fire a weapon like that um, with the action next to my face paraphrasing but and then from the Americans side saying much the same thing thanks um, I think the next one's from Tom what is the future of the bullpup design with France adoption of a non bullpup leaving only their British, China, Israel, and the AUG still in service. Will militaries adopt bullpups in the future? I think you've covered that slightly in your talk. But... I've yeah, we've, and in one of the other answers. But um, th there's the Croatian VHS two, which has got limited adoption. Um, the Israeli Tavor is being looked at and adopted. India have adopted that on a limited basis as well. I, I think the future of the bullpup is as a niche weapon for forces that need it or think they need it. So uh, for the Israelis, it makes sense that they're operating out of vehicles a lot. They're operating in close quarters a lot without getting into um, any of, anything of what's actually going on um, with them. But it, it, uh, it does make sense for that role and why they're the ones to really push the technology forward in terms of making it as functional as a normal um, rifle. Then there's the NSGW trials in America who knows, the General Dynamics RM177 might win and they might adopt the result of that trial, but I think that's unlikely. So I think it will, and there's not much coming up that's new that's bullpup either. So I think it will be not, not even special forces necessarily because they tend to favor conventional rifles, but um, small armies, security forces, maybe we'll even see a swing back towards police um, using them because being compact is great if you're jumping in and out of a Ford Focus. Uh, but at the moment, um, I don't know, there are no police forces in the UK that use bullpups, so. Thank you. There's a few that we've got from YouTube as well. So um, how often is hot gas expelled from the chamber into the face of the shooter? 
Is it a real thing or is it like the overheating G36 that is mainly an attempt to bury the idea? Hmm. Bit of both, I think. Um, the only thing, the only bullpup I know of where that's actually a problem, admittedly, I haven't fired any Thornycrofts because I, I wouldn't allow myself to um, put one forward for, for testing because um, they're basically all different. And I think it's a bit too much of a risk for the, for the information we would gain. Um, but so, so I can't really speak to the early ones that they, they talk about gas escape being a problem in, uh, in, the, in that early trial. So perhaps for that, I mean, that, that's quite an exposed action right next to your face. So it could be a problem. Uh, where it definitely was a problem was with EM2. Uh, I've experienced it myself because we, we had one of those prepared for firing and I fired it and the gas and it fits perfectly with the trial reports from, from America in particular, where gas doesn't jet into your face and hurt you. Cause we, we made sure that wasn't the problem before we allowed me to shoot it. Um, it, it comes out at lower speed from both the ejection port that's to blow your eye and from the cocking handle slot in front. And that, that can spurt it quite, quite aggressively towards your eye and it's quite distracting and it makes you blink and it makes your eyes water and and that was complained about all the way through two solutions for that that you'll see in detail in in the book if you read it um there's a flange on the cocking handle to try and make it go that way it's all a bit heath robinson and then a, a big flange on the carrying handle sight mount that sort of just tries to shield you from it but it doesn't shield you from it drifting up from the ejection port so i don't i think it's a quirk of the em2's bolt design that means it kind of drifts up out of there and then it's a big over gassed um long stroke piston system that's spurting gas out of a slot in the gun in front as well so that was an inherent one of several several inherent problems to em2 uh, it would also fire double two shots when you don't want it to not great um, nice and safe on a test range though um and the trigger was terrible and was never fixed. So anyway, sorry, I'm going off the point there. Well, that's interesting. Thank you. Good to know what you're up to on the range. Yeah. <laughs> it's a while ago now. <laughs> um, next one is how much did the rejection and lack of feedback given to Thornycroft have to do with the government preferring to use the Enfield from the government owned Royal Small Arms Factory? Uh, everything, I think. <laughs> well uh partly that because this is this was 1902 the smle was was just coming up for approval in the next few months so they they there's a sunk cost thing there that they weren't ever even if it was the best thing since sliced bread i think it would be unlikely they would take it much further forward um there'd be a lot of people who would look quite silly if they suddenly went actually this gentleman inventor from cumbria has beaten us we're gonna have to adopt his rifle no because you're gonna have to adopt a whole new fleet of rifles rather than uh, because the first SMLEs were converted from the long rifles, which is a, you know, saves on the cost and familiarity training wise. You didn't have to change the training really other than the charger loading, which was retrofitted to the long rifles as well. Um, so it was really, it, it's the government keeping a, or, or the small arms committee keeping a weather eye on where technology is going right now for where we go next. I don't think they were seriously thinking about reconsidering. They were looking at, right, we're finessing the in Enfield for now. We might well want to replace that with something in the future. This comes back again in 1913. They want to replace it with the Patton 13 rifle with a small high, small high velocity bullet um, and a totally new rifle that, that, Go, that rolls back a lot of the ideas of the, of the SMLE. That doesn't get adopted either, but um, not, not in that form. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of this, a lot of it, just because something's seen trials, there's something called test and evaluation now. And that's really what they were doing then. They were just keeping an eye out, making sure that they've got something that's good enough. Thanks. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to pick a, a couple more and, and then we'll explain how we can cover other questions later. Yeah. Um, was the bullpup especially suitable for the British, given that the troubles led to a lot of CQB fighting rather than open field fighting more suited to a standard design rifle? I think it probably was. I'm not, uh, I don't have any prior service. You'd, you'd be better off asking people who've actually served, especially if they were in Northern Ireland. But I did find one quote about it, uh, 
you know, it, it's a bit difficult running through a doorway in Belfast with an SLR, paraphrasing, because this thing was incredibly long. Um, but they managed, and they also had the use of the um, uh, Sterling submachine gun, should they require it. And of course, the idea was not necessarily that you were fighting house to house every day of the week, but of course, they did have to charge in and out of doorways sometimes, sadly. So it, again, it comes back to good enough. The SLR was good enough and you could run in it, jump in, out of a 432 or out of a Wessex perfectly well with it once you, you know, there's a, you, you, only, you only get Laurel and hardy once before your mates take the mitt um, and you adapt a way of getting the rifle through the doorway. <laughs> And then, so last one, with the SREM, so the, the Enfield Sniper Rifle, since it was cocked by moving the grip laterally, is there any published data on what force was required to do this? Uh, it was actually um, fore and aft. It's not, not obvious from my slide, but it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't go laterally. It goes, um, it's like a pump action. Um, but the, same, the question is still valid. Um, no, but I've done it. Um, and it, it's more the position of the release catch because it's locked by a catch and you have to depress that, pull it to the rear, push it forward. It's more forced than a pump action. Well, no, it's probably about the same as some pump action shotguns. And it's, but, but you're doing it with your firing hand with the butt in the shoulder. It's much like a pump action shotgun. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry because there are so many questions here, but we are going to have to end there. Um, Blame me. I, I yammered for too long. <laughs> not at all, Jonathan. Your lecture was incredibly interesting and that just shows by the number of questions and, and all the thanks that you've got in the chats uh, and Q&As, which you might not have seen yet. So, um, so thank you very much. And um, just to say that if you do want your questions covering by Jonathan, if you go to inquiries at armories.org.uk, use that email address, you will get hold of Jonathan and our other curators as necessary. So, and I'm sure he'd be more than willing to reply to you all um, on all of the questions that you've answered and um, asked today. So thank you very much, Jonathan, uh, for today's lecture, but also thanks to Robbie for producing the event, the event behind the scenes and to you, the audience, and for all the questions you had for Jonathan. Um, our next event will take place on the 21st of January when Dr. Emma Levitt will be joining us to speak about masculine comp competition in the Tudor Tilt Yard, which played itself out in everything from armor quality and martial prowess to the impression left by the contestant's entrance. So definitely something to look forward to. Um, for details of this and all of our future events, keep an eye on our website, which I've mentioned, so that's royalarmories.org, or follow us on the social media network of your choice or Eventbrite. And um, yeah, just thank you again for spending time with us today. Really looking forward to hopefully seeing you in two weeks time. But in the meantime, take care, everyone, and um, bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.